Good afternoon. So thank you for joining us for the Contemporary Military Forum titled, In a War for Talent, Recruiting, Retention, and Opportunity. I'm Pam Swan, the Vice President of Military Relations and Business Development for Veterans United Home Loans. Veterans United is an AUSA star sponsor and is very proud to be part of this professional development forum. As the leading VA purchase lender, it is vitally important to us to work with like-minded organizations that support and protect our service members, our veterans, and their quality of life and veteran benefits. Veterans United provides itself, prides itself on educating our men and women that have served this great nation and helping them with their earned benefits. This is large part as to why we also carry the highest satisfaction rating in the mortgage industry today, which is 97%. I am a little biased as a soldier's wife, but this conference is my favorite. That is why we chose AUSA this year to announce our new campaign, hashtag thanks to veterans. You will notice that between now and Veterans Day, our company with, along with two of our former Sergeant Majors of the Army, Kenneth Preston and Daniel Daly, we will be traveling coast to coast across this nation starting tomorrow, helping veterans make their community stronger, shoulder to shoulder, giving our veterans that passion that they miss after leaving service. We are very proud to announce this at AUSA, and we hope that you get a chance to view our um, RV that we have up on Hall E. And when this event stops, if you would like to run down to 18, 1803, we have actor, comedian Rob Regal doing a meet and greet, so we hope you stop by 1803 and meet Rob before he ends his meet and greet. We appreciate what the Association of the United States Army does for the Army, the total Army, through educating, informing, and connecting as we see right here at AUS AUSA's annual meeting. Thank you for being part of this program. Now I will turn the floor over to the President of the Women in Military Service and American Memorial Foundation, one of AUSA's distingu distinguished senior fellows, and I'd like to say also my friend, Chief Warrant Officer 5, retired Phyllis Wilson. Thank you, Pam. And for anybody that's standing in the back from where I'm up here, there are lots of open seats. And this is a two-hour panel, so please, if you're looking for a place to sit, take, take that opportunity. Yes, the Association of the United States Army is proud to provide forums like this one throughout the year that broaden the knowledge base on Army professionals and those who support our Army. AUSA will amplify the U.S. Army's narrative to audiences inside the Army and help to further the Association's mission to be the voice for the Army, support for the soldier. Of course, we cannot do this alone. AUSA relies on its members to help tell the Army's story and to support our soldiers and their families. A strong membership base is vitally important for our advocacy advocacy efforts on, in Congress, the Pentagon, and the defense industrial base, and to the public in communities across the country through AUSA's 122 chapters within the United States and eight countries overseas. If you are an AUSA member, thank you. And for those of you Army professionals who are not yet members, of your professional association, we encourage you to join AUSA by visiting the membership booth, number 307, in Exhibit Hall A, or you can sign up online at ausa.org membership. Now, it's my distinct honor to introduce to you our first speaker, the Chief of Staff of the Army, General James C. McConville, sir. Well, th well, thank you, and, and thanks for inviting me to uh, say a couple opening words. And, and, and those that know me, I am very, very passionate about people in the Army, uh, and we are in a war for talent. And when, when, I, when I think about you know, the Army, it, it is people. They're our greatest strength. They're our most important weapon system. And every soldier, every family member, every Department of the Army civilian, and every soldier for life matters. And as we take a look at ourselves, 
Uh, we're in a very challenging uh, recruiting environment. We've, we've talked about those type of things. Um, but we have uh, opportunities to offer young men and women unlike any other place. And so what we want to do is make sure we're taking advantage of the talent uh, that we have in the military. We have to retain not only soldiers, but families. And so we have to be very, very aggressive about their, that. And we have to manage talent differently. You know, at least, you know, I, I, I have uh, three kids that are millennials that serve in the Army, so I get pretty candid feedback on, you know, how well we're doing. Um, but, you know, they want us to compete for their talents. They want us to recognize that they're not interchangeable parts in an industrial age system. And, and I believe uh, the young people today, they want purpose and they, they want us to recognize their talents and we, they want us to give an opportunity for, for them to grow and, and the Army's absolutely the right place to do that. And you know, the, you got a great panel here. Uh, they, they, they cover all walks of, of life. They get some great insights. But what we have to do right now, one, one thing that I appreciate having a recruiting crisis in the Army, and we're calling that right now when we're coming out and saying that is, this is when you can make change. This is when you can do innovative things to change the organization for the future. If we're doing things in, in the personnel business that are 10, 20, 30, or 40 years old, then you know, we're, we're not moving forward. And, and, and we need to make that change. And we need to go out into the civilian sector and show young men and women why they should join the United States Army. You know, right now, 83% of the young men and women that come into the Army are coming from military family members. 44% come from JROTC. So we need to expose young men and women to the opportunities uh, in, in the military. And only 23% are qualified to come in. And, and the Secretary and I have been very clear, and, and, and I want to remain clear, we are not going to lower standards. To me, quality is, is more important than quantity. But what we're going to do is we're going to invest in American youth. And we're going to give them an opportunity. I think some of you are aware that we've we stood up a, a future soldier prep course at Fort Jackson. And I think that may be the way we do business in the future. We've had already had about 1,000 kids um, come through that process. And it gives them an opportunity to beef up their ASVAB scores, uh, to get into uh, physical condition, and the initial results are very, very impressive. 75% of the kids that are coming that were barely meeting the standards are doing extremely well. The other thing I was really surprised to see, not only meeting the standards, some of these kids are really exceeding the standards. They've finally been given a structured, disciplined framework to learn and also to uh, work out. And they're losing 2 to 6% body fat and they're up in their, their, their ASVAB scores. And then when they're going into initial military training, as some of you know, they're actually being moved into leadership positions, which for a lot of these young men and women, they probably haven't ever had that opportunity. So it may be the future for us. And the numbers, you know, you might go to the assessment course and that may be a way we give a lot of people an opportunity to serve. And then quite frankly, if you're not fit for the military, the Army's not for everybody. And you know, it's hard to, to tell until you get young men and women there if it's the right thing for them. But you know, before we invest a lot of time and resources in them, is we give them a chance to come and try out. So we're gonna do that. The other thing we, we have to do, and this is for our recruiters, is take advantage of the technology. You know, we're still doing a lot of things in an industrial age manner. We, our recruiters are spending too much time doing paperwork and we've got to do a better job of that, and we've got, to, you know, we've got some uh, systems that are coming into place. And then once, we're, once we have soldiers in the Army, we have to retain them. We're investing in them, and, and what we want to do is, is manage them uh, by their knowledge, skills, and behavior, and, and even, which is blasphemous in the Army, is understand what their preferences are, and maybe even let them go do what they want to do if, 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 if the job fits that. So we're going to do that too. And I just talked to Khaki today. I had a chance to talk to this CEO and um, IPSA is coming, you know, and that's going to help us, you know, move into the 21st century when it comes to managing talent. And the thing about talent management is, you know, we basically manage 
Officers and NCOs by two variables. This is their rank and this is their MOS. That's not the future. We need to know all their, their knowledge, skills, and behavior. And, and one of the best examples I've seen of that is a young specialist, medic, down at the software factory who codes at the PhD level. We would never know that by um, his MOS or his grade. And we have so many talented soldiers, especially in the National Guard and Reserve, that bring incredible talents to us. And we've got to be able to manage those, and we've got to be able to play them in, in that position. So I'm excited about what we're doing in talent management. We're going to compete. We're going to be the best at managing talent. So everyone wants to serve with us, everyone wants to stay, and everyone wants to join the Army. And I look forward to hearing, hearing this panel. They're going to give you all the answers, and they're going to tell you how to make this happen. So thank you. Thank you, sir. Now I would like to introduce our panelists to you. First, I'm going to be going from your left to right. General Gary M. Brito, the Commanding General of the United States Army Training and Doctrine Command. Ms. Julie Boland, the United States Chair and EY America's Managing Partner. Major General Johnny K. Davis, the Commanding General of the United States Army Recruiting Command. Ms. Stephanie Miller, the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Military Personnel Policy. And Dr. Bruce Orvis, Senior Behavioral Scientist of the RAND Corporation. At this time, each of the panelists will take approximately three to five minutes for opening remarks. We'll start with General Brito. Hey, thank you, Chief Wilson, for the opportunity. And I'm sure I can probably speak for many of the panel, all of the panel, panel members as well, that we share the same passion that our chief has uh, for the people in our Army. And I would argue and suggest that modernization of our talent management systems and how we manage those three important pillars of end strength, recruiting slash accessions, attrition and retention, deserve as much focus in modernization as it does in modernizing our equipment in the Army, whether it's a new tank, new helicopter, what have you. And without that, we really won't, or we'll continually fight this war on talent. And the chief mentioned many of the environmental factors that we're talking to. So one month into command, very excited about being part of that and helping to manage the people for our Army as we continue to have the best Army that our nation needs to continue to, to, continue to fight our, 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 our nation's wars. And again, very important. Uh, the chief did mention a near-term challenge, and I turn, uh, prefer to flip that into an opportunity that we're having in recruiting. And it's no secret that we did not meet our recruiting numbers this year and a direct impact on our end strength. But we're still a very combat-ready Army. We're going to turn this ship in an opportunity for us. And I won't get into some of the other comments that may be made by uh, following uh, panel members, but lots of opportunity to do some innovative thinking on both how we run our recruiting enterprise internal uh, to TRADOC, and very thankful for the assistance of the bigger Army as well. And I'll just highlight a couple of things that are helping us in the recruiting lane. I'll talk a little bit about the 21st century talent management that the Army's been doing for a couple of years and will continue to do as we modernize as well, and then turn it over to a fellow panel member, very cognizant of the time. Uh, but I would like to mention the full Army, really DOD support to turn in this recruiting challenge into a very effective opportunity. And one thing we, we've started doing just recently, we'll continue to do, is alignment with our fellow commands uh, that are supporting TRADOC. Uh, specifically, I'll give a couple examples. And working with my battle buddy in Forcecom, where he's aligned the, corp, the, the corps and the divisions with the, uh, the five recruiting brigades, plus, plus one, our, our medical brigade as well, across the nation, so that we can showcase our army, educate those who have a propensity to serve, or even those who, more importantly, don't have a propensity to serve, to include their parents, principals, and others to show how great this Army is and the 150 plus jobs and opportunities that it can offer. Uh, that's with Forcecom doing the same with the Centers of Excellence across all the TRADOC, my battle buddies in USOC and USAPAC as well, to reach all of the states and territories uh, and the soldiers, future soldiers that may want to join the Army and increase that propensity to, to serve. And once joining the Army, the, the Chief highlighted the future soldier prep course all great things to boost and give additional opportunities for academic proficiency and physical proficiency as well, which feed into the high quality of every single soldier and leader 
and our civilian professionals in some aspects as well, and that there'll be no wavering on the quality. And very quickly, in a 21st century talent management, I know this is not new, and I would offer a team, this management is not only limited to, to our to military uniform, we have over 280,000 civilian professionals supporting an Army as well, and all these initiatives are very well nested with our Army campaign plan, as they should. So as the Chief mentioned, uh, utilizing KSBs to help manage the knowledge, skills, behaviors, and preferences of our leaders in the Army. I can highlight a few great programs. We're in uh, over 3,500 have gone through our command assessment program, of which has been uh, tailored for our command sergeant majors as well. And some of the civilians work in the acquisition corps. Chaplains and others have experienced it. To identify the very best leader who deserves to, the privilege of standing in front of those young men and women and civilians that serve our great military. And that's just but one aspect of it. The marketplace and others, again, giving options, giving talent, giving preferences uh, to, to the talent uh, in that we're competing with the civilian sector and we need those great quality soldiers, leaders, and civilians in the Army as well. So I look forward to entertaining your questions uh, throughout the day and again, very honored to be on this panel. Thank you. Julie, before you jump in, I wanted to make sure everybody in the audience knows this is going to be a question and answer heavy uh, forum. So start thinking about your questions because as soon as they finish all of their opening remarks, if anybody wants to come up to the microphone uh, and start asking the questions, we'll be ready for you. And if you don't have any, we do have a few that I will get started to get your collective thoughts flowing and be ready to ask those questions. So go ahead, John, Julie. Great. Well, first of all, thank you all for inviting me to be here. Um, it is a pleasure. I've been looking forward to it. I actually did quite a bit of research and talked to our EY team um, getting prepared for this. And I will tell you, it is a pleasure to see how parallel our values are for our organization, EY, as well as the um, armies. Um, in addition, some of the the challenges and opportunities that we face. So, so thank you, I'm looking forward to learning from everyone up here and, and sharing some best practices. Um, so let, let me just start, you know, and I think we'll probably all say something similar, but th it is an incredibly dynamic labor market. Ever since the pandemic, a couple statistics we've heard, there are two jobs out there for every unemployed person. So people who are not working have multiple choices. And we've seen, at least within our organization, a lot of change and a lot of turn because of that, because of those choices. And so what we, it's required us and a lot of our clients to step back and really say, okay, how do we do things differently? How do we reevaluate? How do we pull apart? How do we understand what the different generations are? How do we be adaptable? And how do we make sure that we innovate around recruiting and retention? So just to level set a little bit, EY, you'll see some of the parallelisms. Um, so EY is a $45 billion global organization. We have about 365,000 people around the world. Last year alone, we got 4 million applications and we hired 160,000 people, 62% over the prior year. Now, we had to fill in some gaps. We had to fill in some gaps because we had lost people to some attrition. But the, the order of magnitude by any stretch of the imagination is incredible. And so as we kind of were looking, we're saying, what are the things we actively did and that we actively changed? And so if we think about recruiting and retention, because you know, retention you know, is just as critically important, really saying, make, making sure in recruiting we had a multifaceted approach, that we were looking and really sourcing a pipeline of candidates who had the skill sets and capabilities and competencies at the standards we need. So how did we multifacet, how do we break down barriers and how do we think about resourcing people differently? And then in regards to um, retention, making sure from a compensation and benefits, that's one thing and it's important to be market leading, or at least um, market competitive, but also what's the culture you're trying to create? What's the culture of care? How do we care for our people and make them feel like they belong to something bigger and uh, bigger than themselves? And so it kind of goes to your point on purpose. Um, how do we um, how do we bring our purpose to life? And so our purpose at EY is called um, building a better working world, and that really resonates. The average age of our workforce is 28. So we've got a multi-generational, but we're also attracting in our brand as we think about the, our clients, like our clients on campus and our clients in high schools, how do we brand ourselves? And so as we think through that retention, 
it's bringing that purpose. How do, we, how do we foster a culture around diversity and inclusiveness? And that's part of who we are as a firm. So I, I'm looking forward to the questions because I think we can go into some very tactical details on how we do that. But I just wanted to kind of share the complexity of our organization. Um, strategic talent is, is probably the number one thing that we talk about. Um, and I think similar to the comments that you made earlier. Same thing with our clients. Um, we spend a lot of time with the C-suite, and this tends to be the number one strategic matter that they're facing. So I look forward to um, speaking to all of you and hearing from everyone else. Thanks. Well, well first of all, thanks, Chief. Uh, my name is Johnny Davis, and I am your U.S. Army recruiting uh, commander, and I've been in command six days. And, uh, you know, I love it because uh, I think every day uh, I, I get a lot of folks who want to help me, uh, and I appreciate that, and I'm sure by the end of today I'll figure it all out. Uh, but, hey, let me tell you uh, what I see from uh, the trenches. Uh, so I have a, a wonderful, exceptional uh, team of uh, recruiters who are stationed all around this world. They're not all in the United States. Every zip code has a U.S. Army recruiter uh, who is responsible for it. Uh, in addition to that, overseas, Japan, Micronesia, Guam, you name it, U.S. Army recruiters, wherever they are, that's the U.S. Army. Uh, and I've, I've listened to them. Uh, and I'll tell you, uh, and based off what we've, we've seen, there's a lot of headwinds out there, and they're seeing it. These men and women are seeing it firsthand. Uh, given the you know, civilian job market, uh, as you mentioned, ma'am, you're absolutely right, it's, it's tough. Qualification requirements, uh, negative perceptions, fear of harmful behaviors. Uh, but let me share with you what, what I'm hearing from the recruiters. Uh, and when they get out, as they begin to talk with their communities, which they haven't really had access to in two and a half years. So think about that. Now they're reintroducing the United States Army uh, back into the communities. But what they've said to me is, sir, most importantly, the public does not know our army. And so I need to share that with you because that's coming from the trenches. I also asked each and every one of these men and women within the command, I had eight simple questions. Hey, if you were the commanding general, uh, let me know what you would change uh, or tell me about your, your living conditions wherever you are. Remember, these are sergeants and their families who lived on an installation, selected for recruiting, and now are in Bozeman, Montana. Think about that. Uh, so after two or three PCSs, now they're remote, they don't have commissary, they don't have a PX, they don't have the hospital. Uh, so everything they have is remote to include paying co-pays, tolls, I can go on and on. So this is impacting all of these wonderful men and women. They are us. And they're out there representing the United States Army. So I sent out an eight-question survey. Uh, within uh, 10 days, I received 44,000 responses. Uh, and what they've shared with me, uh, and I'll just share this with you, and then I'll, I'll pass uh, the mic on, was, hey, sir, we'd like you to, to really focus on the following areas. And I am. I'm listening to them. Um, sir, support and resources. Uh, sir, talent management. Create the positive climate. This is what they're telling me, and I want to share this with each and every one of you. Uh, reduce stress on a recruiting force. So that is something they've asked me to do. Sir, look at training. Uh, so remember, we have a, a, you know, a large contingent, about 155 of uh, master trainers, so we have to look at, hey, do we need to bring them back in post-COVID as we introduce our Army back to our communities and retrain and recertify and redeploy? And then, of course, uh, increase access. And that's where I would ask everybody's help for all of these men and women representing your army. Help them uh, gain access. And I can explain access based off a, a probably a, a follow-up question. And then the last thing, sir, drive positive change. We're in a, this is an opportunity. The way we move forward now is the way we can change an industrial model and recruit uh, for the future and really change the way we do business. So I need your help uh, and not, again, these are the 44,000 responses for these men and women uh, in the recruiting force, and I'm listening to them, and now I'm sharing that with each and every one of you. Thanks, I look forward to your questions. 
Thank you. My name is Stephanie Miller. I'm the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Military Personnel Policy and appreciate being uh, invited by AUSA and the Army to be a part of the panel. Um, we've had the, the pleasure in OSD to work with all of the services, but truly Army most closely over the course of the last year as we tried to um, adjust to the headwinds that all the services are facing. Um, and I will say that, as you heard from General McConville, um, the Department of the Army leadership is all in uh, on this issue. You hear it from the other panel members, um, you know, and really see some innovative practices coming out of, um, at, you know, USAREC, Cadet Command, TRADOC, um, G1, uh, ASA MNRA, all the way up to General McConville and Secretary Warmoth, and, um, and it is encouraging to see such an all-in spirit to try and address these challenges. Our responsibility at OSD is to try to provide lift to their effort, to try to clear barriers, understand the landscape, and then to help work with Congress to potentially gain additional authorities or to modernize the authorities that we have um, such that we can be more adept at what we do. Uh, we're very pleased to say across all of the services that we recruited about 170,000 um, American young men and women uh, to come into the military, and we're excited that they're about to join their, their brothers and sisters in arms, but we have a lot more work to do, and um, this past year, the only service that actually met both their active and reserve component mission for recruiting was the United States Marine Corps. So Army is not the only service that's facing this challenge, it's, it's all the services, um, and in many respects, we thought, well, we just need to get through fiscal year 22, we're going to turn the page, it will be in fiscal year 23. But for those of us that really work these problem every day, we'll say that fiscal year 23 is looking just as challenging, if not more than 22. Um, all of the services are headed into this recruiting year with probably some of the most shallow debt pools that they've ever had. Um, and the market dynamics have not significantly changed. Um, and uh, one of the biggest challenges we have is just that propensity to serve. Um, we strongly believe in looking at the information that we have about the, the market that we're trying to recruit from, that they're, they're really driven by a passion for purpose, relationships, and a clear path to success. We strongly believe that whether it's the Department of the Army or any of the other services, we offer um, an opportunity to find, you know, meet those requirements head on in all three of those areas. And they, it may sound trite, um, it's not that they're necessarily saying no and no, it's just that they don't know K-N-O-W about what those opportunities are and, and how we can um, you know, meet their drive for, for passion, for purpose, for relationships, and a clear path to success. Some of the things that we've been trying to do at the OSD level, um, particularly in working with Congress, is taking a look at some of those authorities I mentioned, um, particularly in the areas of marketing and advertising. Our existing authorities are largely based on kind of a 1990s telephone book model, directory level information. Um, we do a lot, uh, both internally and with our strategic marketing and advertising partners, um, to work creatively within those authorities. Um, but really, what we are able to do on a day-to-day -day basis is nowhere near what you see coming out of the more sophisticated marketing and advertising um, that you see, particularly from you know Silicon Valley or Chicago or Boston or New York. Um, we're really a blunt force instrument in many respects in what we're able to do, and we're looking to be able to be more of a a precision deliverer of our messaging and our strategy. If you work with the generation that we're trying to recruit from or you have them in your family, you know that they are very market savvy. They're very attuned to filtering out the messages that they're not really interested in. They're very sensitive to what they feel like is not organic content. Um, and they have the ability to tailor the content that they are seeing to a greater degree than we've ever seen. Just think about your own viewing habits on a day-to-day -day basis, whether it's Netflix or Amazon Prime or ESPN Plus, there's no marketing content whatsoever. Um, and so we have to work harder than ever to make sure that our mar marketing and, and our strategies are getting in front of people where we count success in a matter of seconds. The other thing that we're trying to do is uh, work with our, um, our, our, our kind of board of directors across the river, if you will, is to take a look at our existing um, authorities for um, money, whether it's appropriate to still try to approach some of our um, appropriations as one-year appropriations, or would it be better to do two-year appropriations for certain um, program lines aligned to the accession and recruiting uh, side of the house? Because with that, then we can actually do earlier market buys. We can get better um, advertising placement. Uh, just might be better for us uh, all around. 
The other thing that we're doing is asking for more support to kind of get a foothold back inside of um, the local communities in our high schools. Uh, what we've seen in terms of looking at the data is we've really kind of um, stepped away from that high school market. Part of that is kind of losing that connective tissue with them over the pandemic years where they were largely operating remotely. And part of it is just because there's a heightened focus in our um, public and private institutions nowadays with a focus of uh, really getting young men and women onto secondary education opportunities in colleges and universities, where sometimes going into an enlistment path in the military is looked upon as not having achieved the level of success um, that, that we may have, that may have been, you know, kind of drummed into them. One of the other things we see within this generation that we're recruiting from is many of their own parents are first generation graduates of college themselves. And so for them, um, particularly in some uh, minority or, or diverse populations, they see not going on to a secondary education opportunity as not being successful. We certainly believe that going into the military, whether it's an officer path or an enlistment path, um, is going to drive you along a path to success that includes a lot of different education opportunities. And we need to do a better job of making sure that we are explaining that um, not only to youth and to influencers. So I think that there's a number of things that we can do in terms of taking a look at our past practices, our current authorities, and better understanding collectively with Army and the other services where we want to go, and then helping at the OSD level to get from point a to point B, um, while at the same time making sure that we're sustaining the high quality that we know that we need today and in the future to meet our combatant command and other operational requirements. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm happy to be here. I want to thank General Gervais for inviting me to the panel. I was given a bit of guidance on two areas to talk about, so I will touch on that. The first is some thoughts on strengthening recruiting, and the second is on the design an assessment of marketing and recruiting programs, drawing on the analytical background. So let's start with general market expansion and to echo something that General Davis just said, there's ample evidence from survey that youth and influencers know very little, shockingly little about the military services and service in general. So one thought with support in some survey did is to push basic information to youth and their influencers on the considerable breadth of jobs and training that the Army offers to pique their interest and to get them then more interested in following up and learning more about service. There's also been interest that expressed in further penetrating the college market. Something to be aware of there is that there are different subpopulations who would need different types of programs to attract them. So for example, program to appeal to recruits who are willing to defer college until after service that could be used with the post 9-11 GI Bill in the same way that the Army College Fund used to be usable with the older GI Bill, which was something unique to the Army at that time. And perhaps a program for those not willing to wait to help them work toward a year or two towards an associate degree, so they would do that between enlistment and going on to active duty. Increased use of marketing programs for those who are willing to enroll and attend classes while serving, such as the concurrent admission program. And for those who already have some college, the thought is to expand the loan repayment program with lower caps on the amount that's repaid, but less stringent eligibility criteria, which are pretty strict right now. In terms of optimizing recruiting resources, Analysis suggests over the years that suggested this, that the Army has over-relied on enlistment bonuses. There are reasons for them. You need them. But they tend to be overused relative to marketing. And that has a very significant effect on cost and the amount of recruits that are produced. Another area is to try and use uh, analysis that we're aware of to help recruiters improve, improve their productivity. That could be, for example, accounting as fully as possible for the difficulty of recruiting in local sub-markets and taking that into account on, in recruiter assignments and missioning. We can also increase, let's echo something you just said, data-enabled outreach and CRM that would require some relief from restrictions on government use of those approaches. And we can think about adding enlistment options. So one example would be an enlistment approach that offers a menu of options to prospective recruits where they're trading off non-monetary and monetary options 
that gives them greater ability to get packages that they want, but it also winds up saving recruiting resources at the same time because the bonuses offered with these non-bonuses options as supplements are smaller than standalone enlistment bonuses. We need to continue working towards strengthening uh, marketing ROI. That means continuing the regular assessments that the Army Enterprise Marketing Office is doing where it's looking on ROI in terms of leads, appointments, and contracts. It means increasing the detail, the granularity of the data that's collected on the marketing outcomes to better distinguish which tactics are actually the most effective ones from those that are not. There are issues with the data. And we also need to understand how different tactics affect outcomes differently in either different geographies or by the socio-demographic characteristics of the leads and contracts that they generate. So some, some would generate different uh, types of leads and contracts than others. We can use experimental variation in spending levels across marketing tactics to try and pinpoint their causal effects. And we can use what's called quasi-experimental designs in local marketing to try and distinguish events and activities that are consistently effective from those that are not, and do more of the former, obviously. In designing programs, marketing and recruiting, we have a variety of analytical approaches available to help us do that well. Focus groups and survey data, the concerns there are sufficient number of groups and sample size, and appropriate composition relative to the target population. Past research results are generally available and can you can find ones that are appropriate for a new program that might be considered. And there are simulation tools that are also often available. They can look at, for example, the effects of changes in the accession cohort characteristics on first term performance and costs, or the optimal allocation of recruiting levels and uh, mix for a given accession requirement and set of economic conditions. In assessing effects, Again, a variety of measures, attitude and low propensity change. We need pre and post program start data to do that. We need representative samples. Multivariate analysis of outcomes such as leads and contracts and both quasi-experimental and experimental designs for those approaches which produce some of the most accurate results you need before and after results for when the program started and you need balanced test areas and comparison areas. The difference between quasi-experimental and experimental is you can do quasi-experimental after the fact of a program to try and pinpoint what you, what you got out of it. Experimental requires front end, so it requires lead time and uh, more setup time to get the answer. Uh, last, some additional considerations. The data you need to evaluate a new program, is it routinely collected or is this going to require a special effort that's going to require more setup time? Let's make sure we're measuring causation and not correlation. There you need balanced tests and comparison areas and controls for confounding factors. And then are you measuring attitudinal or behavioral outcomes? You have to understand what the relationship is between the two of those. So for example, you have to consider the relationship of a change in attitude to propensity, what that actually translates to in terms of enlistments. It is not one-to-one, -one. it is much less so the enlistment rates of people who say they are come in are far from 100%, much lower than that. And the negative attitude of propensity group is so large that it historically has counted for at least half or more of the enlistees. So there's a difference between measuring attitude and behavior and we need to be sensitive to that. And I realize this last half was technical so I'm sticking with the area I was asked to address. <laughs> Apologies. <laughs> I never like statistics, I'm just saying. <laughs> but I do want to know, I want a feel of who's in the audience right now. Anybody that's been involved in recruiting, please stand up. Ouch. Okay, we're going to have fun today. <laughs> I'm hopeful. Thank you very much. And uh, we appreciate uh, the hard work. And, and when uh, General Davis was speaking about this, I have never personally been have, carrying a green sheet or any of those kind of things, but you're right, the stressors that we place on our recruiters is tremendous. And I think that's one of the things that we do have to find a way to get at.
Um, so the microphones are open. If anybody has a question, come, well, he's ready. There we go. Come on down. I picked the right seat and everything. We're front loaded. Come on down. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, my name is uh, Matt Siegel. I am a retired reserve colonel. Uh, I had three and a half years active duty, 25 years as a reservist, served from company command up to Pentagon and White House staff. So I've got a background. I'm the ESGR uh, Employment Outreach Director for North Carolina and I'm a previous chapter of a Military Officers Association of America chapter. Also in my civilian career, I spent 28 years with this little company you may have heard of called McDonald's. And I worked in Asia, Europe, and the United States. And the last group that I said this to asked me when the McRib was coming back. <laughs> okay, but that's really, really not my purpose. But if anybody wants to talk about that, we can do so after this is over. Anyhow, I want to talk about recruiting and using soldiers for life and so on and so forth. For example, in medical recruiting, uh, through AUSA and some members of AUSA, word got to my wife and I that they were looking for a way to get into medical schools because of COVID shutdowns and all that other stuff. And it turns out we knew somebody who was, we arranged a meeting and we were able to get them into medical schools to recruit. That's an example of the small kinds of things we can do. Army recruiting battalions in the past have had community advisory boards. They come and they go, depending upon the commander. Okay, what we did about four commanders ago was we actually raised funding to bring recruits who were not going tomorrow, but were, uh, had signed on and their parents in for a dinner and a speech. We raised funding for that. Unfortunately, next year the JAG had a different opinion on how we should, we should uh, go with that. One other thing I do is I'm a test administrator at, at, uh, at MEPS part-time. I go into high schools all the time, and I also administer tests at MEPS. I think MEPS should be in meetings like this. They're not here. They need to be. They really need to be because they're an important part. We deal with recruiters uh, all the time, and so that's a good thing to do. Um, the, uh, and, you know, the chief said we have to get innovative, and we really do with these shortfalls. And there are just so many ways we can do it. And what I would say to you is reach out to soldiers for life like me. We don't sit on committees and things like that. We're just out in the communities doing the work. We can help you any way we want. And the last comment I would make is look at the labor participation rate, not so much the unemployment rate. There are, that keeps going down. We can help raise that up so people that we don't reach maybe would be potential candidates for the military. Well, sir, uh, first of all, thanks, and thanks for your service. And one thing I wanted to add, um, and that was, a, it was three uh, great comments, but let me, we touch on each of those. And let me tell you, this is what keeps me up at night and what I plan to do. I just finished pinning, personally pinning a note uh, that will be the uh, uh, key article for the Army Echoes uh, magazine, or, uh, pamphlet that goes out to all Army retirees. It'll go out one November to all 1.5 million. Uh, and you will see my message. It is very direct, specific. Uh, I'll give you access to the Army Careers app. But more importantly, I want the, all of them to take the next seven to 10 days and move to their closest recruiting station that we can, you can locate right in the map and, uh, and offer your assistance. Uh, one, to access. The other, to education. So that's one. Yesterday, I had the opportunity to speak with the CASAs and all AARAs to talk about that commu community leader access. You and I are, are, are thinking the same thing, sir, and it's on my mind, but I'm, I can't get it out fast enough, uh, and I'm trying to move very quickly uh, with each step. That is going to happen next, and then I will uh, pin a, I'm, I'm almost finished with my note to all uh, general officers uh, and retired officers with instructions for each one of them. Uh, and, sir, everything you've said, I've captured, but essentially we are, this is, we're taking the step forward uh, for, to educate and, uh, and connect 
and then uh, create more access. We're here to help. Yes, sir. If I could just add to that, first of all, thank you for being a test administrator. Um, and while MEPS may not be in the room um, at an OSD level, we we do have operational responsibility for all the MEPS. Um, so which MEPS are you at? Raleigh. Raleigh. Okay. Um, so being a test administrator is so critically important. These are the, the folks that go into high schools and actually administer the ASVAP in high schools and then often help facilitate post-test interpretation um, and other aspects of the program. And actually where we still see a foothold inside of high schools, it's usually our test administrators um, because they've formed long-term relationships with the local high schools and there's a level of trust. Three next week. Great. So glad to hear that, um, because as you all know, recruiters um, are so important, but in, in essence, we are turning over recruiters um, about one third a year in terms of coming in. And so it's establishing a relationship almost every three years with a school and a high school and administrator, um, whereas the test administrators have often had those relationships for even in some cases decades. Um, and so I completely agree with you that there is a value in making sure that we're partnering with our test administrators we're partnering them with our recruiters um, to make introductions and to you know gain that level of trust uh, and where there's more recommendations from our test administrators broadly on how to get that um, uh, you know access back into the schools i think that's a really good point i would make one comment on that when i do a test administration the last thing i say in a high school is there anything else i can do for you that's those are my words walking out the door and so they're never out of our mind one last one, Matt. If you get more than you wanted today, this is awesome. Hey, uh, we are being innovative with our Soldier for Life transition program as well. A job assistance, a partnership with the businesses as well. They're giving job opportunities for those soldiers either retiring or getting out after their first first assignment. And I, I think you can well appreciate, you know, that that makes him a great ambassador for their time and service in the military. And go back and talk to family members, bring a soldier in. And that's also just exiting the service, whether 20 or not, with some level of dignity and respect. And that's important. And as you mentioned, it takes some very innovative thought also. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Carlos Riquilla Diaz. Buenas tardes. The reason I'm greeting you in Spanish is because we are a more diverse country and we're, getting, we're going to become even more diverse. So my question is very simple. I've been a member of uh, what's called HALO, which is the Hispanic, Law, uh, Hispanic American Leadership Organization. When I got to law school, I was a member of HALSA, NALSA, and BALSA, which is the Black Law Student Association, the Hispanic Law Student Association, and the Native American Association. I'm also a McNair Scholar and a president of LULAC. The reason I mention all of those chapters and organizations is because not one time was there a government recruiter or a military recruiter. I'm a former infantry officer via OCS, and after leaving the military, I got promoted to a military spouse. My suggestion to you is that we have so many programs, whether it's minority or women programs, that we are not tapping into. I'm a former dean of a college, and I never have problems recruiting people because I know lots of folks who know lots of folks and who belong to that organization or to that group. And they went in there and recruited for me. And that's how I've been successful. Just because you send someone to an organization, that doesn't mean they're going to identify with the people you're trying to recruit. Don't send a cat person if they're a dog person or vice versa. We all know how we feel more comfortable. So I have to get going because I have to get my child. But my suggestion is that send people to those organizations, upper bound. They will do the work for you. Use them. Look up different organizations in your communities the, you know, the ones I'm most familiar with is the minority communities. I've never had a problem recruiting folks. So I leave you with that because we're not utilizing those wonderful resources out there. Sir, and I very much appreciate those suggestions and we totally concur with you. Not only from a policy perspective, we'll deal with that, but just connecting with those soldiers who may or may or not want to join and have a propensity to serve. Somebody you're comfortable talking to, someone who can relate to you, your family conditions, the whole bit. So I concur with you. And certainly something we're taking on both as a big army uh, through our sessions, our, our recruiting task force, which is assisting us at the Department of the Army level within TRADOC. And I, I won't get into, I know Johnny could probably talk to this in detail on how we're going to do it at the street level, the kitchen table level with all the communities that you just mentioned. Thank you so much. Great suggestion, though. Thank you very much. Don't Thank be you. late picking up your kid, though. No, no. <laughs> Sorry. 
Hi, I'm Yvette Busico. I'm the Acting Assistant Secretary of the Army for Manpower and Reserve Affairs. I work with all of these wonderful colleagues on the stage, and I just wanted to um, add on to what General Brito said. Um, we are re we're working closely with our civic um, organizations. In fact, uh, the Army had a center of excellence at the National LULAC um, convention in Puerto Rico just a couple of um, weeks ago. I see the Sergeant Major uh, in the front who was there speaking on, on, the, on our behalf. We have BEA, we have um, a lot of connective tissue with those civic organizations, so I want to assure you that all that we are actively, we have in the past, and we are going to continue working with those kinds of organizations in the future. Um, Mr. Beach, um, the DASA for ENI, um, Godain in Inclusion, um, and also, he is the principal advisor to the Secretary of the Army, reports to her through uh, the MNRA, and works very closely with those organizations each and every day. So, we are doing that. I don't have a question. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. Sir. Thanks to everybody on the panel and everybody in the audience, quite frankly, for your leadership, your passion, and the specific line of effort that you're responsible for in terms of not just recruiting but retention and opportunity. And I think, as I heard Ms. Miller allude to when we talk about opportunity, we're also talking about transition. Um, and so addressing, you know, sir, as you framed, and not just the challenges but, but the opportunities. Uh, my name is Miguel Howe with the Aurelian Group, but more importantly, I'm a soldier for life having spent 25 years in infantry and special forces, but perhaps one of the most impactful assignments I had was as the commander of the Southern California Recruiting Battalion from 2008 to 2010. Uh, so not quite the same market environment that we face today, but nonetheless, coming out of the surge, a challenging time. Uh, flash forward to 2013 when I retired and I had the honor to be selected to serve under President Bush overseeing his transition programs for military service members, transitioning military, and our veterans. Uh, and at that time, the crisis was veteran employment, uh, particularly for our junior enlisted without a four-year degree. Flash forward 10 years, that is not the crisis. Now the crisis is recruiting. But it was striking to me, having spent times on, on both of those issue areas, um, that we are really good at attacking those problem sets in different pillars, but I came to find it's the same people, it's the same centers of influence, it's the same issues in terms of tying together that continuum of purpose, belonging, and opportunity. Uh, and I loved how the chief framed it, an opportunity like no other, be all you can be. Um, and so my question is, how are we thinking and approaching the issue of recruiting, but tying together the full life cycle in terms of service and retention, and then the transition, um, because the success across all three are really integrated. Thank you. I'll, I'll start and I'll pass it off to my battle buddy, Johnny. And I definitely don't want to oversimplify this because this is very complicated. And first of all, Miguel, thanks for your, for your service, both in uniform and continued interest out of uniform as well. Very much appreciate that. Um, but part of it came to just really understanding the total environment. And as you said, from a future soldier at his kitchen table, all the way to when they transition from a OCPs to a suit and tie. And all that needs to be put into this. So I would offer up, and definitely an approach that we're taking now, Mrs. Busico mentioned that the task force support we're getting at the Army. Mrs. Miller clearly represents the OSD level support. Also reach out to academia and others so that we understand this, and, and our civilian professionals as well, representing the civilian market. Uh, to put it back in my grunt terms, though, and operationalized in this solution. What are you doing? In, what can we do in the strategic space? What can we needs to be done in the operational space and the tactical space as well? Not to say that the operational approach is a solution to everything, but we're the Army, and that's how we solve problems, and this is a tough problem, and we do hard stuff in, in going to get it done. But the, 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 the players in all of that are not only just uniformed as well, a recruiting command, working with academia, working with the principals, working with the hospitals, as I just mentioned, our, our policies and programs for Transition for Life, to get at this thing and, and get at it quickly uh, before it impacts the readiness of the Army, which we're not going to allow to happen. And I know General Davis, and I don't want to steal this thunder, is, is very much taking some very innovative approach, looking internal to our recruiting enterprise, which is large, and understanding the landscape, understanding the problem, 
uh, do we need to attack the uh, look? I'm sorry, look at the, the how we market uh, differently. And I would offer a yes, both locally, nationally, and down at the strategic level as well. And based off one of the questions we had, also, our reach out to those that we may not have in the past uh, to give that opportunity uh, to continue to serve, whether it's one enlistment, 20 years upon retirement, and transition with dignity and respect. Johnny, I've taken way too much, but I would no. like to get your <laughs> thoughts as well. Well, first of all, thanks, uh, sir. That's a, uh, a great question and something that uh, has been certainly on my mind. Uh, because why? We're beginning to really see ourselves in this environment, uh, given the challenges. And it's really opened our eyes. So when I think about the ability to uh, penetrate uh, down across the communities, uh, we, we have a bunch of agencies that exist, but we didn't really synchronize them. So that's what I'm, what you just said is something I am, I am personally involved in, in terms of how to fully utilize uh, leverage soldiers for life, local marketing, our uh, social media, our partnerships. Uh, one of the things, uh, big, uh, big thanks to the uh, uh, chief was partnering a active duty division with each of our recruiting brigades. So example, the 101st Airborne Division is directly linked with our third recruiting brigade. This has never happened before in history. And what we have to do with that small brigade is really leverage all of these wonderful assets uh, and really be able to have an impact in that, uh, that brigade uh, area of operation. And, not, and don't forget, bring in school superintendents, CASAs, ARAs. I mean, I can go down a list. So when I think, I call it the super summit uh, with all my teammates. If you execute an event, is the super summit uh, involved and have, just like you said, VSOs. How do we bring everyone together to uh, maximize our wonderful impact wherever we are? So thanks. And, and I'll just add briefly, because I know we have other folks who want to ask questions, but on your point about transition, I think at an OSD level, it's something that we're very attuned to. Um, it's not survey data that we collect, it comes from someplace else, but um, there is some indication that uh, military members themselves are less likely to recommend military service uh, to the youth in their lives. We've seen that metric increase. And I think for us, it's very important to make sure that um, in a transition that it's a positive experience um, so that, that they don't leave for whatever reasons that they're choosing to leave or it's, it's a full retirement, that that process is um, a, a smooth process, it's positive, um, and that uh, we are potentially even showcasing opportunities we still have to stay connected with the, the military, um, at, whether full-time, part-time, uh, even outside you know, the USA jobs, very strict confines. Um, we are committed to that so much so that we're actually looking at right now our transition assistance programs oversight within OSD is within our readiness division. We're actually looking at moving it to my division um, as kind of a personnel life cycle approach. And so I think your point is extremely well made um, because it does come full circle. It does. Thank you so much. I'm confident that with this leadership, we have all the capabilities just tying it all together, as you said, sir, operationalizing and activating all of our networks. When we look back at 2030, I hope we look back at this panel and look what, look what we as an Army did. Thank you. Thank you. Um, quickly, many of you may have uh, question cards, blank cards that you can fill out. If we do not get to all of them, we will be collecting these and we will be sharing them with the panel, asking for them to provide their remarks and comments and we'll get those pushed back out at a later date. So don't be hesitant to complete the cards at this time. Yes, sir, please go yeah. ahead. Uh, McCarley, Mark McCarley. Uh, upon my retirement from this great army, I returned to home a record and found myself a commissioner of my small city. And within that array of uh, civic leaders, a good number supported junior ROTC and lamented the fact that it was very difficult to locate uh, junior ROTCs within the school district, uh, some attributable to uh, political issues and others attributable to resources. And so with that, the question has to be, is the Ar Army prepared to uh, direct greater resources toward that invaluable program? And before General Davis answers that question, I have a, a note of gratitude and commendation for something you and your staff did uh, with respect to recruiting. Uh, and of course, 
talking about the Army and its impact, uh, you opened the aperture for uh, 1,800 retired uh, general officers and flag officers uh, to make contact with both your senior ROTCs and your junior ROTCs. Now we are infusing, this is from TIFCON, the flag and general officer organization. Some of you will, of course, matriculate to that organization upon retirement. And we are infusing those general officers and some flag officers into the JRTC, the high schools, for the purpose of explaining the Army message, uh, foreign policy discussions, and of course, reaching out for the big purpose of recruitment. Well, first of all, sir, uh, thanks, and uh, I know um, I'm in recruiting command now, but I, I did depart uh, cadet command, so I'm very familiar with junior ROTC. So uh, there is uh, discussions about expansion. And let me just to set the stage, let me provide context. So the program was initiated in 1916. It really stood up in this, uh, some of the uh, states in the southeast, Florida, some in Georgia, Louisiana. And it really blossomed from that over the last uh, 100 years. So about 70% of our J junior ROTCs are sitting in the, what is the Florida, up through Virginia, through to uh, Texas. Uh, and that's where, so there's not uh, equal distribution across the United States. So the, there's a request uh, to expand depending on decisions. Don't want to get ahead of our Army senior leaders, but uh, up to 50 schools a year for five years, which would uh, impact, first of all, we want to place them in areas where the Army's not and impact up to 300,000 additional students. Uh, so, I mean, as you know, that's, uh, that's uh, ongoing. Uh, but it is, uh, it, it's just to give you an idea, when you think about, let's say, you know, Georgia, there's more JRTCs in, let's say, Georgia than there are in Michigan, Illinois, Wisconsin, and Minnesota combined. So, thank, thank you. you.